everybody to Symbio Beta Live. My name is John Cumbers and I'm the founder and the CEO of Symbio Beta. And what a time for biology to thrive in the craziness of the global pandemic. We're honored today to have a very special guest, the CEO of Moderna, Stefan Bansell, who is joining us from his home in Massachusetts. Moderna just put a, vi a viral uh, vaccine, sorry, just put a vaccine into trial in Seattle last Monday. And we're going to be hearing about uh, how that's going uh, what we can learn from RNA vaccines, which is what Moderna does, and what the future of healthcare looks like with Moderna's platform. We have hundreds of people who are going to be joining us today all over the world dialing in for this, and it's an honor to be able to host Stefan. It's an interactive live webinar, so we ask you to please type in any questions that you have for Stefan during the presentation into the Q&A box just below. And also a new feature that we're enabling is that you can rank other people's questions. So we're bound to get a lot of questions and I want you to know which are the most uh, high priority questions that I should be asking Stefan. In addition, we want you to ask the questions yourself. So if you want to come online and you can come on either with audio or with video, just raise your hand. You can look at the button below and it says raise your hand and you can ask uh, Stefan your question directly. We'd just like to start off by asking where you're dialing in from. So if you want to type into the chat box, uh, we'll see where everybody around the world is joining us from. And if you have questions throughout then you can just type them into the box, I'll either ask them or you can ask them directly. Um, so with that, I want, to, uh, I want to dive in and introduce uh, Stefan Bansell. Uh, Stefan uh, is originally from France. He was with Biomiru, a, a, a diagnostics uh, company in France, moved over to Massachusetts, has a MBA from Harvard Business School, and founded Moderna in 2011 and is the CEO of Moderna. Stefan, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a crazy time all around the world. Uh, before uh, we, we proceed with your presentation, I just want to check in. How is, uh, how's uh, things in Massachusetts? And then, and then how's things from, uh, from the country that you grew up in, in France right now? So Massachusetts seems so far to be doing uh, relatively well compared to other states. Uh, I think the state was very quick to move to confinement and people were pretty quick to move to kind of social distancing. So knocking on wood, uh, compared to other states so far, the, the number of cases is, is relatively low, which is a good thing for our neighbors and friends. Uh, in France, it's a, a bit tougher, as you might read in, a, in the media. Uh, they just passed 1,100 deaths today. Uh, and so we're kind of tracking to Italy. So it's not doing so good. I'm sorry to hear that. So um, we want to be able to pitch your presentation today and the discussion that we have to the right audience. So we have actually a poll for everybody who's dialing in. And the poll we want to ask is a couple of questions about how much you uh, already know about, uh, about what we're going to be talking about in terms of RNA vaccines today. Are you a novice, intermediate, or you are an expert in this area? And then we're also interested in what's your professional background. Are you in academia? Are you in industry? Uh, are you focusing on business, investment, or other? Uh, so we'll show the results of those polls uh, shortly and we'll be able to pitch our, pitch our dialogue accordingly. In the meantime, Stefan, you'll be interested to know we have people dialing in from all around the world, including Florida, San Francisco, Seattle, Austria, New Hampshire, LA, Vienna, Edinburgh, San Francisco, Berkeley, Massachusetts, San Francisco, uh, San Jose, and, uh, and San Diego. So uh, a huge number of people who are dialing in uh, to hear what you've got to say today. And if we just want to show the results, we can see we have about 50% uh, of people are saying that they are uh, uh, intermediate knowledge, uh, about 14% advanced and 36% novice. So that will help us uh, pitch where we uh, have this conversation. And uh, we have a lot of people from industry and business. If we add those two together, that's about 50%, 20% from academia, 12% are investors today and 10% uh, and others. So uh, thank you very much. So with that, I'm going to pass over to you, Stefan. And uh, if you want to share your screen now, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Moderna platform, what are these RNA vaccines, um, how do they get into cells, and then we're going to, of course, talk about this uh, very exciting uh, clinical trial that started in Seattle last Monday. So, Stefan, over to you. Thank you, John. And again, thanks for having me. Uh, maybe one clarification. I'm not the founder of Moderna. I was employee number two. The company was co-founded by flagship venture, Nubar Afeyan and three academic co-founders, uh, Ken Chen, 
uh, Bob Langer from MIT and Derek Rossley. So uh, thanks for inviting me. Let's talk about clarification. Sure. So before we start, I just have to remind everybody that given the company is publicly traded, uh, I, we're going to be making forward-looking statements that developing MR in medicine is complicated, and especially I would say uh, with a global COVID-19 pandemic, things are changing very rapidly. Uh, so uh, we might change our strategy or our choices based on what we learn from the science on a daily basis. So let me start with something that everybody knows, uh, the central dogma of molecular biology. So in 2010, um, the co-founders started the company with a notion that instead of making protein in E. coli or Cho cell in big tanks, uh, what if we could use messenger RNA to inject in human directly a synthetic messenger RNA to produce protein in the human body? So of course, to most people, including me, when I first heard the idea, I'm like, this is crazy uh, because mRNA we all learned in our biology class is a very unstable molecule, is highly immunogenic. So those are not good drug properties. But there were some recent scientific breakthroughs that led us to believe that there might be a new way where you could make immunosilent messenger RNA so that you could potentially make protein in vivo from synthetic mRNA. And so this is how we started the company from this idea, or this question, sorry, what if mRNA could be a drug? And let me pause a second because um, the reason I presume that mRNA is so immunogenic, it creates such an immune response is because this is how viruses in the world all around us are trying to get into our bodies all the time. So the first line of defense is, is if RNA or DNA is coming into the body, recognize it as foreign, produce antibodies against it and try to get rid of it. Is that right? That's correct. We'll talk about it in a few minutes when we get into a bit of science for a few slides. But Great. indeed, because a lot of viruses, including corona or the flu, are mRNA uh, molecules. Through evolution, our immune system has evolved to be able to recognize patterns of mRNA and to trigger an immune response when they, when they find an mRNA. Great, thank you. So, why were we so excited about the potential of mRNA as a new class of medicine. And it's important to know that these were our core beliefs since the first discussion I had with Nuba about Moderna when he was a one employee uh, company with, I think at the time, uh, less than $2 million of cash. Uh, so he was just literally at the conceptual phase of a company. So the idea that if you could bring, like you see on the, on the left, uh, uh, sorry. If you see here on the left, if you could bring the mRNA into a cell and use the ribosome machinery to make a protein, you could make secreted proteins, which is what the recombinant industry does. You could make transmembrane protein, protein that are attached to the membrane of a cell. Or you could make intracellular protein, protein that goes into the ER, the nucleus, or inside mitochondria, or any subcompartment of a cell. So that uh, was of course very exciting because our first, the large product opportunity this could represent. As many of you know, around two thirds of a human protein encoded in human DNA codes for protein that are either transmembrane or intracellular. And those protein you cannot make as a drug using recombinant. So two thirds uh, of these thousands of proteins. So as you know, uh, that's an incredible product opportunity. Uh, the second piece that was very exciting to us, where we said, look, if we could find a way to make mRNA a medicine, we believe that the probability of technical success of a drug to go from the lab into approval should be much higher. We believed it should be materially higher than the probability of traditional medicine. As you know, most medicine that enter the clinic will never get approved. Most medicines that people work in the labs will never go to the clinic. That's you know the, the data and the facts of traditional medicine. And we thought with mRNA, the priority of technical success 
from an idea of a drug to a clinic to a launch should be much higher for a few reasons. The first one is we said, look, again, this is early days kind of thinking. We had no way to prove it at the time, but we say, look, we cannot believe making a human protein in a human cell is gonna be worse than making a human protein in a bacteria cell. Uh, which is, if you remember, this is how the biotech industry started with Isha Isha Coli. Then he moved to Cho cells and other system, but it started in Isha Isha Coli. And even Cho cells, when you think about it, are Chinese uh, hamster ovaries. Uh, those are not even human cells. So that's the first reason. The second reason is uh, we said, because mRNA is an information molecule, if let's say a first vaccine work, a second vaccine should work exactly the same. Because when you think about it, we design our drug using genetic information. We're gonna talk about it in a minute, let's talk about our vaccine. But if we design a vaccine, we use the sequence of a virus and with that information to design our vaccine. And when we make a, a, a drug, we use uh, the human genome sequence to design the drug. Um, and so when you think about it from a biology standpoint, we don't guess the biology. We use biology uh, of nature. Uh, the other piece that was exciting that we believed should increase the probability of technical success was the ability to combine mRNA. If you look at the literature, uh, it is believed that we have in you know, between eight and uh, 10,000 mRNA in each of our cells at any given time. And so we said to ourselves, look, if nature is able to put in a liquid phase solution, i.e. water in your cell, a lot of mRNA together, we should be able to find a way to do that in a synthetic way. And if that's possible, then we should be able for some diseases to be able to design the right drugs that do the right biology. And we'll talk about it in a minute. We have in phase two in the clinical trial right now, a vaccine that has six mRNA in each vial. That is a bit like science fiction uh, for traditional recombinant. But that's a, a reason we believe that for some diseases, the ability to do exactly the natural biology should increase the chance of a work to get to market. The right. third piece, sorry. Go yeah, ahead, go, go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask about this, uh, the, the, what is this uh, that we can see on the outside of the cell, the round thing that's going into the, into the ribosome. Maybe that's what you're going to explain now. Yes, I'll go on the next slide about it. It's, the, it's a delivery system. It's how do you bring the mRNA into the cell. Great. So that thing here on the left is a delivery system that basically brings the mRNA into the cells that then can use the ribosome to make the protein you want. So the third piece that was really exciting to us is speed. You know, having trained in big pharma myself, uh, it was always very frustrating how the research process sometimes took years. Uh, because when you think about it in traditional medicine, every time a scientist has an hypothesis about a medicine, he or she needs to figure out how to make that molecule. And by definition, most mo molecules they work on do not exist in nature. So you have to invest from, invent from a chemistry standpoint, let's say if it's a small molecule, the, the synthetic pathway to that compound. Uh, and then once you have a good drug that you like in preclinical model and you say, we think this is a drug we want to test in a clinic, you then need to figure out how to make that at larger scale so that you can make the material according to 21 CFR from FDA to get into clinical trial. And it means that every product is unique. So for every product you have in the lab to invent how to make you know, a few milligram or a few gram of it, so you can run your animal work. And then how can make you know, hundreds of grams or kilos in the clinical setting. And what we said is because mRNA, again, is an information molecule based on four letters, the four letters of life, uh, is gonna be a platform. So we should be able to go very fast. And if we robotize, invest in process development and industrialize early or technology, we should be able to scale very quickly because whether we make mRNA for a flu vaccine or we make mRNA for a rare disease in the liver, or you make mRNA for injecting a drug in the heart, it's gonna be the same manufacturing process regardless of what the mRNA codes for. 
And so that should allow us to go very fast into the clinic. Uh, and it should allow us to do very quick research because if you robotize and industrialize everything, the cost of an incremental mRNA to do discovery is going to be in the thousands of dollars. And so when you think about the investment you're going to make of you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in clinical trials, what you want to solve for is having the best possible drugs to take that one to the clinic. And so if it's almost free to do as many different drugs in the labs to test your different scientific hypotheses, then that's a massive advantage. And the fourth piece that we are very excited about is uh, unlike recombinant protein, which are made in big reactors because they are made in cells. Uh, and if you concentrate the reaction too much, you basically kill the cells. Uh, and so you don't make your product. But this is why if you look at the biotech plants, they are very, very big reactors, you know, 20,000 liter reactors. Because you have a lot of solution, you end up having very big purification systems. So you have very big plants that are very expensive. And here, one of the beauty of mRNA because of synthetic biology is mRNA you know, is made using enzymes in water. And so actually, the more you concentrate the reaction in your, in your reactor, the faster the reaction goes. And so you end up having very small vessels. Anybody that comes and visits our factory uh, is always shocked by how small everything is. Uh, because if you have a small reactor because you don't need cells to make the product, then you have very small purification system. Uh, and you have very small losses. And the other piece around the capital efficiency is because, again, it's a platform and we make all the products using the same uh, reactors, the same rooms, uh, the same teams. You have incredible capital efficiency. I mean, if you think about Corona, which we're gonna talk about in a minute again, we didn't have to invest $1 of CapEx uh, to get a new machine to do the Corona vaccine. We just use exactly the same machines and equipment and, and team members than for all of our products. Great. So just to summarize, we've got a platform for the production of RNA. It's very low cost, miniaturized, very rapid to iterate. You can capture that RNA inside one of these vesicles that you can see in the image here. You can hide it from the body's immune system as it's getting inside the, the cell. Then it releases its payload. The vesicle breaks down. It releases its, its mm -hmm. payload. And then the drug can, can, can become an enzyme or it could remain as, a, as an RNA and it can go do its thing. But you've got a, a new platform now for getting medicine past the immune system into the body and a rapid way to iterate and synthesize many different uh, mRNAs for many different kinds of diseases. And you can tag the efficiency of, of what they're doing inside of the cell. Correct. Wonderful. It seems easy. Explain now. Trust me, it was the science was really complicated. <laughs> and I think uh, we've invested around six or seven hundred million dollars over the last nine years to, to get there. So again, that's the beauty of platform, which is massive investment up front, a lot of complicated science, a lot of complicated process development. But because it's a platform, getting the first one to work is really hard and expensive. But the second one is very quick. Uh, right. So we'll come back to it in a minute. Excellent. So if we just double click a little bit on the science, uh, you basically have three big components of our science. You have the mRNA molecule itself. You have a delivery system that basically brings the mRNA inside the human cells. And you have all the manufacturing processes for those two systems, the mRNA and the, the lipid system. So if I just double click, uh, the piece we love about mRNA is it has so many dimensions that we can play with. It's really an amazing platform. So on the chemistry front, one of the most important innovation that is used in 100% of our product is 100% of our uridin are modified. We use uridine analog to your point earlier, John, to evade the immune system, especially TLR7 and TLR8, which for the scientists sit upstream of interferon, where basically TLR7 and TLR8, what they do is they recognize uridine. That's their job. They are looking for uridine molecule. Uh, and when they find them, they basically activate. And because they stream, sit upstream of interferon, they, they secret interferon and they go and they basically want to shut down protein production. And so we have to figure out how to do that uh, correctly by modifying the chemistry. Uh, then we have done a lot of work and still doing more work on sequence engineering. If you think about an amount, it's a very, very long molecule. For example, the corona 
uh, Emani is more than 4,000 base pair. So it's like a four kilobyte you know, message. So it's a very big molecule. And if you look at it, and it's again a pictogram, uh, you have a lo lot of secondary structure that create those loops because it is not a straight line molecule. Because of hybridization, you have a lot of do the domain of a molecule that's going to start you know, binding to each other. And you can play tremendously with that science to, uh, to control your molecule and to do a lot of super cool, cool thing from a scientific standpoint. The other piece that a lot of people that don't have molecular biology background don't always appreciate is there's a feature uh, in molecular biology and mRNA that for a lot of, of drug hunters uh, is a very nice feature, which is we know how to turn off our message if it gets in the wrong cells. So if you think about it from a drug hunter perspective, if for whatever scientific reason, you realize that the delivery system you design takes the mRNA, let's say to two cell type, two different cells in the body, but you only want to express a protein in one cell type, where there is a mechanism called microRNAs that we can code in the, you know, uh, free prime UTR untranslated region of our message. So that if the mRNA gets into the wrong cell, it will bind to that microRNA that floats into the cell where you don't want to express the protein. It will bind to the mRNA and the mRNA will get degraded very quickly. This is a natural phenomenon. We did not invent that. Nature and evolution did. We just using that in, as we designed the drug to basically turn the drug off. So that's a sort of very nice feature of this technology that allows you to uh, really fine tune the safety profile of a molecule. So that's how we messenger. Yeah, we have a couple of questions about uridine. Uh, what is uridine and what does it normally do inside of the cell? So uridine is one of the four letters of life. It is used in all the messenger RNA that you make inside the nucleus of your cell. But if a foreign mRNA comes in, as we discussed earlier, that could be the U of a virus, of the instruction of a virus, uh, that's what the cell is looking for to shut it down. Because the cell, what it will do from a biology standpoint, if he thinks it's infected by a virus, he will try through evolution mechanisms to shut down protein to stop virus replication. And apologies, the difference between uridine and uracil? Oh, it's just, it's just the, the, if it's you know, a, a, a triphosphate, a diphosphate, it's just, it's, it's, it's very, at, at this level, I suggest given we have a non-scientific audience with a survey, it, 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 it's, it's very similar. Got it. So uh, when d the d DNA, A, C, T, and G, RNA, uh, A, C, U, and G, so it's the conversion, it's, it's, it's one of the key characteristics of RNA is that the Ts are converted into Us. And then what you're saying is that inside every cell, there is this mechanism, this TLR3 mechanism. That seven, seven and eight. Oh, sorry, TLR7 and eight, which are these enzymes that are, that are constantly on the lookout trying to find uh, uridine and, 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 uh, foreign RNA that's coming into it where it can check it and then and then it degrades it, you said, or it, 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 there's some other mechanism? No, that it, it, what it does, it, it, it triggers interferon production uh, and the interferon will basically shut down protein production. For, for that specific mRNA? For that cell, yes. For that specific, for oh, the no. cell. No. Yeah, the cell, sometimes we see biology as well. Sometimes cells will, will, will basically shut themselves down, even okay. if it might lead to cell death, just to oh. protect the, the, the body of the system. Got it. So there's an, there's an invader, uh, the, the, uh, the system is activated to shut it down. Correct. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. So then the delivery. Uh, so the delivery system that we use is a lipid nanoparticle. Uh, we started the company by trying all lipid systems. And there were several features of those systems we did not like too much for making our drug. One of them was th those lipids had long half-life, meaning when you inject it in cells, they will stick around for a long time, i.e. days. And if you think about a drug where you're gonna repeat those, like a, a rare genetic disease of a kid that is missing an enzyme, and your goal is to go and provide the message, so they make their own enzyme, and when the enzyme basically depletes from the cells, you inject again, so they make their own enzyme again, and, and you, you keep repeating that. We did not like the long half-life. And so our chemists 
went into an extremely intense effort uh, where they literally invented hundreds uh, of novel lipid, novel composition, uh, to try to really understand with your immunologist, with our biologist, uh, systems that will get the mRNA to the right cells. Lipid that will basically fall apart once they will deliver the cargo of the mRNA into the cells so that they will not have potential toxicity associated with uh, the accumulation of lipid because they have long half-life, if that makes sense. Uh, the other piece that we had to invent is a new PEG system. So if you look at this little pictogram, the PEG is the yellow stuff on the outside of the particle. So the industry had used PEG to provide stability in the vial before you inject the drug. Why is that? Because if you have a lipid into a vial and you think about a lot of little lipid particles like this inside the vial, if you, put, if you don't put those little things, and I will explain what they do again, uh, oversimplifying, so for the PhDs on, on the webcast, please forgive me for simplification. <laughs> But basically, those things are provided so that in the vial, those little balls of lipid, which are fat, don't accumulate into a big fat ball. Because if you put your vial in the fridge for three months, six months, 12 months, as you need to do for pharmaceutical property of a drug, once you get approval, it's gonna be in fridges, you know, of, of a company in its warehouse, of pharmacies, hospital, and so on. You don't want those balls of fat over time to accumulate. And so if you put those little peg molecule around it, they act like little springs. So think about them like it's a 3D little ball where you have little springs everywhere on the outside. So basically they push on each other with the other particles around them. So they don't accumulate into a big fat ball at the bottom of a vial. That makes sense? Yeah, so these LNPs, these, these uh, lipo nanoparticles, is that the L? Yeah, lipid, lipid nanoparticle. So they're lipid nanoparticles. So they're fat, uh, balls of fat with the mRNA inside of it. And you're saying that part of the uh, part of the magic is the chemistry around the uh, this peg polyethylene glycol, this molecule of fat around the ball that allows it to have a longer shelf life before it's then used as a drug. Yes, and so the industry was using that before, so we did not invent peg, of course. Uh, but the piece about the peg that was an issue for messenger RNA, which we have published extensively about, is if you think about it a lipid nanoparticle that we use is around 100 nanometer. It's around the size of a virus. And so if you have those little things, the peg on the outside of a particle, think about it from an immune system standpoint, you inject that into the body. It's around the size of a virus, give or take. And it has all those handles on the outside for your immune system to grab on. And so while we wanted the peg to a pharmaceutical stability in the vial, we did not want the peg inside the body. Got it. And so what the team had to invent is a super smart chemistry, which we got patent uh, issued for that, where basically when you get the lipid from the vial into the body for an injection, when you will touch a fluid, the peg will pop off and just get out of the, the particle, just pop off the particle. Got it. So, so that's one of the things that the team had to invent. The other piece, as I said before, was the lipid itself because the lipid half-life was too long. So we really innovated on the lipid and on the peg. Great. Stefan, I want to do a time check because we're already halfway through and we haven't talked about the vaccine trial of the coronavirus. Okay. So we also have I'm a lot gonna, of questions. I'm going I'm to so, keep, keep quiet. Well, I'll let you speed up and get through the slide yeah, and then I can okay. open it up to okay, Q&A. Progress. So as we started this company, we said, look, because this could be a new class of medicine, we obsessed about technology risk around mRNA and, and lipids, biology risk around disease understanding or lack of, execution risk and financing risk. And what you see is a pictogram of how we've been thinking about technology risk and biology risk. And to reduce technology risk, what we said is, we have to try this technology in different applications. Because if you only pick one application, let's say vaccine, and it doesn't work in a clinic, the company might go under. Uh, and so we try six different technology in parallel. And then in every one of those that they're represented by very different colors, we try different programs, different drugs, so that we will diversify biology risk. And so what happened in 2019, which was, I believe, a big infection year for the company, 
And if you want to learn more, I invite you to go read the shareholder letter that was posted on our website early January of this year. We basically have two of our applications, the infectious disease vaccine in blue and the systemic secreted and cell surface therapeutics here in pink, where we basically had very exciting clinical data that makes us believe that for those two applications, we believe the technology risk is massively reduced. And so what we are doing now is we're doing many more drugs in those two applications. We call those our core modalities. And the other modalities that are still in the clinic trying to figure out are they working safely in human or not are still in exploration. So we have a lot of clinical trials happening for the cancer vaccine, intratumoral immunology, localized regenerative therapeutics and systemic intracellular therapeutics. Most of those things are in the clinic or with open INDs. And so we want to still figure out are those things working in the clinic? Uh, we don't know yet. If they work, we will move those to core modalities and do many more of those drugs with the same technology. If it don't work, we, we will stop them. So that's a bit where we are today. So if we start to get into vaccines, so today you can see here, this is the vaccine pipeline for infectious disease of Moderna. Uh, so you see there's a, quite a lot of programs we own most of them. And if you spend time on each of them and we won't have the time today, those are all first in class vaccines. Meaning if you look across the board, there is no vaccine for any of those viruses that are approved around the world. So we are trying to use the technology not to do me too products, but to be extremely innovative, to bring to the world important vaccines where viruses today are hurting people around the planet, including in the US. So why are we so excited by mRNA and infectious disease vaccine? The first piece, which will not escape many of you, is if you think about it by using mRNA into a human to code for one or several protein of a virus, we totally mimic an actual infection. Let's take Corona as an example. Corona is an mRNA virus. It will get into human cells when you get infected. It will hijack your ribosome to make the protein virus when it replicates. And then you will do it again and again and again. And when you have so many copies of a virus in your body, you get disease. What are we doing here? We're making a synthetic mRNA in our reactor. We inject it into human. We make exactly the protein of the virus we care about. And that protein is presented to your immune system exactly like if you had a natural infection. We can do multiple products, as we said, multiple mRNA in the same vial if the biology requires so. We can go very fast uh, and we have a single facility. So we don't have to have a dedicated plant. If you look today at, for example, a very good vaccine, very successful vaccine from GSK called Shingrix, uh, that vaccine, they cannot make enough of it. They have said publicly, uh, they cannot sell in many countries around the world because they are waiting for a new plant to come in line. And that's the type of business problem we should not have with our technology because uh, it's the it's, uh, same process for every product in our facilities. So what do we know so far about Moderna vaccine platform? So we have injected more than a thousand healthy volunteers across nine different uh, clinical trials around the world. We have dosed up to 400 micrograms. And what we've seen is a safety and tolerability profile is very consistent. We marketed adjuvanted vaccines where if you, if you go onto the FDA website and you pull down the PDF of the side effect profile of those approved vaccine, and you look at our published data, it's very, very similar. You have a bit of local pain, uh, local uh, redness for a day or two that goes by itself, like when you get you know, a normal uh, injection. And then you have for a few subjects, you know, systemic side effects, like a bit of fatigue. Some people develop a little bit of fever. It all goes away by itself. Sometimes people have a bit of chill, you know, like sometimes you get a flu shot and that night you don't feel great. You go to bed, the next morning you're fine. So it's a very similar profile than that. What we have shown in terms of immunogenicity, which is finding antibody in human blood after injecting a vaccine, is that we have shown for six of our program already that we're able to elicit neutralizing antibodies. Meaning if you take the blood of humans getting our vaccines, and you put the vaccine on the virus in a Petri dish, they will neutralize the virus. They will prevent the virus from replicating and from growing. <clears throat> I will not go through all the programs you can read for yourself 
And all this data is available on our website. You can do role play of a conference call we have done with analysts and investors to review the data. But you can see uh, the data of those six, six vaccines. And in February, <clears throat> we announced three new vaccines, a vaccine against corona we're going to talk about, a vaccine against EBV, which is Epstein-Barr virus, which is the virus that gives mononucleosis. Uh, there's still no vaccines to provide, uh, sorry, to prevent teenagers from getting mononucleosis. And we're also launching a pediatric uh, RSV vaccine, which is another respiratory uh, virus, which is the, the second cause of hospitalization in the US and, and around the world uh, after influenza. So let me uh, start to frame the corona uh, vaccine. So this is the data uh, that we have generated around MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which remember that happened a few years ago uh, in the Middle East. And then we had some cases again in South Korea. What you see here on this slide is a rabbit model that was developed working with the NIH, uh, where basically on the left side, you see the concentration of antibodies in uh, the blood, which I'm gonna describe in a minute. And on the right side, what you see is, is the copy of a virus. So it's basically the viral load of a virus that you see after a challenge. So let's start by the left panel. So you see on the, on the log scale, you see basically uh, in, in uh, the, the light gray that stays to zero uh, on the uh, y-axis uh, is a placebo. So as you would expect, animals that get placebo make no antibodies, I would be expected. And then you have in, uh, the, in, in dark, uh, in black, sorry, you have the animals that only got one dose of a vaccine. And in, in light gray, you have in animal who got two doses of a vaccine. The first dose at, at day zero. And then at day 21, they got a second dose. They got a boost. Okay? So what you see here is uh, that you have very nice uh, ability of a vaccine when you come with a second dose at day 21 to increase tremendously, as you can see, by more than a log, the quantity of antibody in the blood of those rabbits. Uh, and then what we do at day 46, where you see the challenge, we basically give to all those animals a very high quantity of a virus. It's called a challenge model, where after vaccination, you give them a virus. What you try to do here is to represent an infection that the animals will get to see, okay, how, the, how well does the vaccine work? And what you see on the right panel is in the throat, in the nose, and in the bronchovial lavage, so basically you give liquid into the, the, the lung to see what you can get uh, into the lung in terms of, of, of material. You see for the same three colors, you see the animals that get the placebo, and again, that is a log scale, have a very high quantity of a virus in the throat, their nose, and the BL. And what you see in the two colors is that in the throat and the nose, uh, and in the throat is where it's the best, in the throat you see no virus. You cannot find copies of a virus after giving a very high challenge to those animals for the vaccinated animals. What you see in the nose, you see a little bit of the virus, which is not surprising because the nose is really basically where you get the, the virus coming into the body. So even though if the vaccine works, they still have presence of a virus because the virus was given to the animals. It's just a very tiny presence that you see. And then you see a little bit that goes down into the lung uh, and you see the difference versus that's just a placebo. So you see around the four log, if you want, reduction uh, in, the, in the viral titer in the BAL and around the three log uh, into the nose. Uh, and you see in the throat, it's, it's below the limit of detection of the assay. Uh, you see nothing. So that's some of the work that we have done with the NIH around the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that was very useful for us as we went into the corona product as soon as we got the sequence from China. Okay. So to keep moving, uh, so our vaccine, mRNA 1273. So on January 11, the Chinese posted the sequence of virus online. By January 13, uh, our team partnering with the NIH, I, I designed the vaccine on the computer. And in our factory, we started making uh, material for the clinic. At the same time, we started also making material for animal testing. 
On February 7, the product was completed. The vaccine was in the vials. But of course, which is very important for quality, we had to go into quality testing, including a two-week test for sterility, which is part of a 21 CFR, uh, the FDA guidelines. Uh, and then we shipped the product on February 24th to the uh, uh, NIAID, which is the division that Dr. Tony Fauci uh, leads, for the clinical study. We filed the IND to the FDA on February 21st, when all the analytical tests for quality were completed. And on March 2nd, the FDA gave a green light to the NIH to start the clinical study. Uh, last Monday, on March 16, uh, in Seattle, the first participant uh, of the study was dosed, and the study is ongoing. Moderna is currently uh, working to uh, potentially file a 9D to start a phase two uh, based on the phase one uh, data. So that's kind of a the current plan and what has happened around this program. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, we do have a lot of questions that are coming in. I know we're almost at the end of the presentation. If you if you have your colleagues from Moderna who are on the uh, on the line, if they want to dive in and they can answer the questions in the uh, in the chat uh, Q and A, that would be great because I don't think we're going to get to all of the questions. <laughs> And if you sure, do want sure. to ask your question live, then uh, just ra press the raise your hand button and, uh, and you can do that. Um, okay, great. Yes, That's and I will also direct people to our website. Uh, if you go to our website, modernatx.com, on the, on the main page, uh, there is a, a click button to go into a special section we did for SARS-CoV-2. So there's a lot of information. There's a lot of press releases that are there. So it's a nice resource. Uh, to get access to a lot of questions you might have around this important vaccine. Great. So a couple of slides to close. Uh, this is just a quick summary of Moderna uh, as of we are today. So we're preparing for a phase three for our CMV vaccine. We have four vaccines that are in phase two or preparing for phase two, 12 ongoing phase one, and now a very large body of data. We have more than 10 positive phase one study that I won't uh, name, they are listed on the slide, that have been shared with the world about uh, the, the, the clinical data of our technology. If you look at our pipeline by uh, therapeutic area, so as I said earlier, we have seven vaccines for unmet medical needs that are all first in class, meaning nothing on the market. There is no vaccine on the market against those important viruses. We have five immuno-oncology drugs that are in the clinic as we speak all combined with a commercial checkpoint, either Ketidra from Merck or, or, or Durva from AstraZeneca, five rare disease program. And we announced in January of this year that we're entering autoimmune disease with two new programs, IL-2 and the PDL one protein program. So far across the platform, we have dosed more than 1,700 uh, humans, either healthy volunteers or patients. The team is more than 800 employees between our uh, Cambridge uh, R&D site and our Norwood uh, factory. Our factory in Norwood was launched in July 2018, 200,000 square feet. Uh, it is fully integrated, meaning we make DNA plasmid as a template. We make the mRNA, we formulate in the lipid nanoparticle, we fill the vial, we do all quality control on site. It's a fully digital site. There is no paper batch record. You know, in our industry, because as you know, it's highly regulated as it should be to ensure the safety of a product for the benefit of the patients. Uh, we have to document everything. You have to double signatures for every entry as you wait products, as you check products. Usually the, the, the batch record is around that thick of paper uh, if you go to big pharma companies. At Moderna, there's no paper batch record. It's 100% electronic. Uh, and we've, we've built a lot of redundancy using, using IT and technology and robotics. We've had partnership with Merck, AstraZeneca, and Vertex. Uh, on the uh, company side, on the government side, we've had several grants from DARPA, which is part of the Department of Defense. We have a Zika grant from BARDA, which is part of HHS. We have a partnership with the Gates Foundation. We have a partnership with CEPI on Corona. So we try to really partner uh, with both industry and governments uh, to make the platform available so we get more drugs out to patients, to help patients. The company is very well capitalized, which is good in those uh, difficult times. We have uh, up to $2 billion to invest in the business, uh, around 1.7 billion of cash 
uh, on the balance sheet. And the balance is basically grants that have been awarded to Moderna from the Gates and the US government that basically we do the work and on a quarterly basis, we send them an invoice and they pay us back. So the cash is not on the balance sheet, but that is capital that we can invest to build the business. I won't go through this slide in detail just to give you more as a pictogram by each of our modalities of where products are in different phases of a pipeline and what we are preparing. And last but not least, of course, very important, the piece that is very exciting for us is that do we believe mRNA can be a new class of medicine next to small molecules that have been with us for 150 years, based to, next to large molecules, i.e. recombinant, that have been with us you know, since Genentech and Amgen and others giant uh, started this industry you know, in the 70s. Uh, and we see it as a very important part of who we are and our mission that we have to make this work for patients. We believe the power of synthetic biology and messenger RNA is extraordinary. I think we can barely uh, comprehend all the medicines that can come out of this technology in the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I don't think that anybody in the early days of recombinant will have believed that uh, seven of the top 10 uh, drugs today on the market are recombinant drug. I think if you could go in a time capsule and tell that to the early genetic and amgen teams, they might not believe you. And we have the same belief and we have this very strong conviction that we have to make this science work. It can do incredible things to the world because we are literally moving from analog medicine, like small molecule, to digital medicine using mRNA. So with this, I conclude my remarks and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Stefan. If you want to unshare your screen, and we have a question from Matt Olson. And if anybody wants to ask that question live, just raise your hand and we will, we will call upon you. Uh, Matt has a question about the timeline. He says, might you be able to provide a timeline range between a very optimistic and a very pessimistic scenario for getting uh, this therapeutic to market, this mRNA to market, from today in terms of months or quarters, acknowledging that the most pessimistic scenario is not getting it to market at all. And while you're doing that, I'm going to share a timeline that we just published, and you can find this on our website and on our Twitter feed, uh, of uh, a visual representation of the timeline using uh, the, uh, the data from the Milken Institute report that they just put out recently. So um, if you can address the timeline, uh, Stefan, then I can, uh, I can also pull up our visual timeline here for everybody to see. Sure. So, I mean, as you say, the worst case scenario is the vaccine doesn't work, i.e. it will never get approved. And of course, it's always a possibility. Uh, as uh, we have shared before, that we have no vaccine approved today. Uh, we have a very uh, encouraging set of data from the six different vaccines that have worked before. Uh, but that's the worst case scenario is a vaccine fails in clinical trial in the phase one in the phase two or in the phase three. The regulators, for a reason, that uh, decide to not approve a product. So that's the worst case scenario, it never gets to market. Uh, then let's go to the other side of it and say the most optimistic scenario, which would require 20 different things to work, i.e. it is risky, but I want to go on the other side of the spectrum to tell you. The most aggressive scenario is you could see a world where you do a phase one, uh, like we are doing now, when you have that data, you move to a phase two slash three as see on the slide. Uh, is it possible that the phase two, three starts earlier than that timeline? I think it's possible. It doesn't mean it will happen. Again, it is risky, but it is, I think, possible. I think everybody is working extremely closely together. As you see, even on that timeline, uh, we started dosing in March. So we're already in phase one in March. So we are ahead of that timeline that others company are following. But I think that given the pandemic, uh, everybody needs to be aware that the NIH, the CDC, the FDA, and industry are collaborating like I've never seen in my career. I've been in this business for 25 years. Uh, the level of engagement, the emails of the middle of the night coming from you know, the government agencies, uh, this is how things have happened in the last two months. In the last two months, people have really pulled together very nicely, been extremely constructive, wanting to help while ensuring safety. Because again, the vaccine, as we all know, is given to healthy people. So safety of 
a clinical study participants, safety, eventually the products were to get approved, are really no, our number one priority and the number one priority of the FDA and the government agencies. So I give you a bracket from never approved to potentially in 2021, it is possible. It will be a world record. As you know, usually it takes five to 10 years or more for vaccines uh, to get approved. But we think given it's a respiratory virus with very high attack rate, that's the reason why you know with so many people are sick uh, and the casualty of death is so high. It's a very, very high transmission rate. So for us vaccine developers, he actually make it easier. It has his own challenges, which we can talk about, but he make it easier because you don't have to wait forever to get cases. Uh, there are actually almost too many cases and too fast. Great. We have a couple of questions. Uh, somebody asking about uh, partnership potential for uh, for a, a manufacturing facility in Mexico, and uh, and would there be a possibility of a joint venture? And then uh, Roman uh, Harala, who is in uh, Slovenia, is asking, what's the maximal production capacity of your current plant in the number of doses, and how long would it take to transfer the technology to other pharmaceutical companies around the world to build a new plant? So a couple of questions about how can, how can the international community or the international companies help to scale this? Yes, so I think there's a lot of questions in there. So I think it depends on what time frame you're talking about. So let me talk about a few time frames. Uh, right now, our teams are very focused in our plant to scale up the process, i.e. making bigger and bigger reactor in the same amount of time so you can make more and more doses per unit of time. Uh, if those teams were to engage in you know, te technology transfer now to other plants, they will not be able to do the process scale up. And so we are very focused on what's the best path to get in the foreseeable future as many values of high quality vaccine as we can uh, out uh, to help as many people as we, as we can. So we believe in the short term, it is a problem we can mostly uh, answer ourselves. Uh, we think in the mid term, I'm talking <coughs> a year, two years time frame, uh, is where working with other companies might be helpful. Uh, we always have a plan for filling the vials to work with other companies. We currently and Moderna do not have the ability to make you know, millions and millions of vials. Uh, and so that capability, which exists in many plants around the world, uh, we intend to partner. We already have discussions ongoing. Nothing has been done, so nothing has been announced. Uh, but we have been uh, communicating that for actually quite a long time now, which is a plant we have is uh, a development plant. It was not built to basically be able to do you know, a billion vials a year. I'm just picking extreme numbers just to make a point. Uh, and so we will have to partner on that front from the get-go, which is highly doable. There are a lot of very good companies out there in the US, outside the US. We can do vial feeding for us. Great, excellent. So we have a lot of questions. We have 13 questions. Uh, and if you have asked a question, make sure to ask it in the Q&A box rather than in the, in the chat box. And then everybody else can vote on the questions and we'll ask the most popular ones. Um, Tina has a question. If we inject mRNA that mimics the virus protein into patients, or the viral uh, RNA in a patient that has just been exposed to COVID without knowing, would that amplify the infection? Does the patient need to be tested to make sure they have not been exposed to COVID-19? So that's something that we have to explore in the clinic. What I can share is our experience with other viruses. So if you look at all our clinical trials that we have run and shared the data, this can happen to any vaccine clinical trial where actually you have People that, when you inject them the first time, are naive to the virus. And there are people when you inject them the first time have already been infected. And there are people when, when you do the first dose, they are naive. But by the time you give them a boost, they got a natural infection. So all those things can happen. So I will point you, for example, to our CMV human data, our cytomegalovirus vaccine. And you will, when you look at the data on our website, what you will see is we run the clinical study. And again, this is not something that Moderna invented. All the vaccine developers do it the same way. We have a placebo group of people that do not get the product, get placebo. So we have a good control strategy for trial design. We have subjects that are CMV negative, meaning they are naive to the virus. And this you can test through a simple serology test through blood work. Uh, and there are people that are CMV positive. And the reason we want to have a CMV positive group is 
first and foremost to ensure the safety for those uh, people in case they will get the vaccine while they already have had the infection before. So it's very important for safety. As I said, safety is our number one priority. And so as any vaccine company working hand in hand with the regulators like the FDA, we always want to ask those questions very early on in the studies so we can understand the safety profile of the vaccine before we expose more people. Again, with vaccines, you, you, you do those healthy subjects. So safety is priority number one. The, if you look at Corona, the phase one is, is 45 subjects, so it's still a small number. And we are testing three different doses, 25 microgram, 100 microgram, and 250 microgram. Uh, and the phase two, if we get there again, assuming good safety of a phase one, assuming good antibody level in the phase one and so on, that there's a good data set that we and the FDA feel comfortable going into a phase two, it will be you know, hundreds of people. Uh, and then assuming the phase two looks good, what we'll do is a phase three, or we could expand the phase two in a phase three. This will have to, of course, again, discuss with the FDA and decide with them, uh, is then you expose thousands of people. It's very important to have a good clinical understanding of a vaccine safety profile and immunogenicity before you get commercial, which is why if you think about it, phase one is dozens of subjects, phase two is hundreds, and phase three is thousands. Because once you get commercial approval from any agency in the world, you can literally sell to millions of people overnight. And so what you want to make sure is you, you, you have seen if there is any risk of an event that has a very small frequency, you want to be able to have caught it before you, you get commercial because you could hurt people, which of course is, is not at all our intent or the intent of the FDA. Got it. Uh, we have uh, Marie-Lisa Dion. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question live? Uh, yes, I don't know if... Um... Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. And if you want to just... Okay, perfect. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted to know um, what, uh, how, what were the factors that were uh, coming in in order to uh, define the antigen that was to be used for this specific candidate? Yes, thank you uh, for your question. So the work we did on the MERS vaccine with the NIH over the last you know, year and a half, two years, was really important. So we picked the spike S protein, which is one of the protein of uh, the virus. And this was really guided by the work we had done with the NIH on MERS. I don't think we would have been able to move so fast if we had never worked on the coronavirus with our technology before, because all that very important foundational work to understand which protein do you pick from the virus, and then to demonstrate, like the data I shared with you today, in the rabbit model to demonstrate that that protein has indeed in the challenge model, the right efficacy that you will expect. Uh, that type of work was really critical for us, which is why when you think about pandemic and preparing against pandemic, I personally believe that we should get government funding uh, to do the, next, the top 10 or 20 viruses that do not have a vaccine today on the market to do all that preclinical work because look at what happened with Zika. Look what happened with Ebola recently. Look at the number of lives that were lost or you know, impacted extremely negatively with a baby with Zika symptoms because there's never been the work done before. Those viruses, we believe, with our technology, we could make vaccine against them, Ebola, you know, Zika, and many, many other. And so you want to get ahead of things. You, know, you see at the speed at which the virus is going around the world, and hurting so many, you cannot chase a pandemic well. Uh, you know, everybody is working really hard in the industry to find a vaccine, to find a therapy, to repurpose drugs, but think about the time it takes to do those clinical studies, to do it correctly, so we understand the quality of the science, we understand the safety of the products, uh, and so you want to get ahead of all that. Excellent. Stefan, we're at time, and I know you have incredibly important work to be doing, and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to come join us today. I'm sorry to everybody whose questions we didn't get to answer, but we hope that you found today's webinar informative, and we hope that you were heartwarmed by Stefan's um, uh, discussion about how the whole biotech industry is coming together, moving at lightning speed to work towards treatment and prevention of COVID-19. So Stefan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We really do appreciate all the work that you're doing. 
thank you everybody for joining in and thank you john uh, and kevin for having me have a nice day bye-bye thanks everybody bye-bye now